I'm Liz Faubless and this is Currents. New attacks on our religious freedoms as Catholics gather at the National Basilica in Washington to pray for liberty. The prayers and thoughts of a nation are with a brave teenage girl as she fights for her life after fighting for freedom. And prayers at Mass, celebrating half a century teaching our children well. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Religious freedom, the right to believe and to teach our faith is under attack again. For some time now, the fight over the HHS mandate has raged in U.S. courts. Now, next door in Canada, a struggle is underway about what may be taught in the Catholic schools there. A new law is being used to possibly prevent Catholics from teaching that abortion is wrong. The Minister of Education in Ontario, Laurel Brotin, is saying that under this new law, we do not allow and we're very clear that Catholic teachings cannot be taught in our schools. That violates human rights. The minister then describes what she considers a big violation. The law is about tackling misogyny. Taking away a woman's right to choose could arguably be one of the most misogynistic actions that one could take. Now, the minister did not outline what actions would be taken against the Catholic schools, but the Archbishop of Toronto, Cardinal Thomas Collins, was quick to respond. Ontario would be a colder, harsher, darker, more cruel place without the generous action of people of faith motivated by their faith. The Cardinal added, the role of people of faith should give pause to those who seek to sterilize public discourse from religious influence. Cardinal Collins says that it is critical to remember that religious freedom is protected by the Canadian Constitution. Now, the guarantees enshrined in our Constitution were on the minds of Catholics yesterday at the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington. Gathered for a special Mass for Life and Liberty, during his homily, Archbishop William Laurie looked to Mary and the Holy Spirit. We may have the understanding, the creativity, and the courage to defend the God-given gifts of life and liberty in the context of our times. For some time now, both life and liberty have been under assault by an overarching godless secularism replete with power and money, but sadly lacking in wisdom, both human and divine, a secularism that relentlessly seeks to marginalize the place of faith in our society. In rejecting the wisdom of religious faith, in seeking to contain and to diminish it, secularism has at the same time foolishly devalued human life. When man and woman are no longer perceived to be created in the image of God, then sooner or later, their lives and their liberties become dispensable. Archbishop Laurie said that 50 million unborn children have lost their lives through abortion since the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision in 1973. Archbishop Laurie also was highly critical of the infringement on religious freedoms found in the HHS mandate, and there's now a new lawsuit against the government order. The Archdiocese of Atlanta, the Archbishop Wilton Gregory, says the church is suing because the stakes are so incredibly high. The HHS mandate forces the church to pay for abortion-causing drugs and other contraceptives. The dispute is expected to be resolved by the Supreme Court. Well, the next presidential debate is almost here, literally. Preparations are underway at Hofstra University on Long Island for tomorrow night's debate. President Obama and Governor Romney will face a town hall gathering where voters will ask questions about both foreign and domestic policy. The two candidates will also be in New York Thursday night for the annual Al Smith Charity Dinner. Invited by Cardinal Timothy Dolan to the Smith Dinner, which has traditionally been a nonpartisan affair filled with humor. This year, some are criticizing the Cardinal for inviting the president because of the ongoing religious liberties fight. Well, besides the dinner, Cardinal Dolan also has a new church. That and more news as Currents continues.
Welcome back. As we reported, Cardinal Collins of Toronto and Cardinal Dolan of New York are at the forefront of the fight for religious liberty. Meantime, they also are receiving new pastoral duties, appointments as honorary leaders of churches in Rome. In this report, Catholic News Service joins Cardinal Dolan as he arrives at his new church. New York's Cardinal Timothy Dolan took possession of his titular church in Rome on Sunday in characteristically ebullient style. His new flock responded accordingly with frequent laughter and applause. Every member of the College of Cardinals holds honorary title to a particular church in Rome, a reminder that the early popes were elected by the city's priests. While most cardinals' titular churches are historic monuments in the city center, Cardinal Dolan said he wanted to be honorary pastor of a normal, living, and active parish and dynamic community of faith. At St. Paul's Cathedral in London, protesters from the so-called Occupy London movement descended upon the church, complaining about economic inequality. Four women then entered the Anglican Cathedral and chained themselves to the pulpit. The demonstration was intended to mark the first anniversary of Occupy London and protest the arrest of a punk band in Russia whose members are opposed to the policies of President Vladimir Putin. There were no injuries. In Bosnia, Christians are fleeing the country in massive numbers amid mounting discrimination coming from Muslims. About a half a million Christians have left the country in recent years. The cardinal of the capital city of Sarajevo is complaining that dozens of mosques have been built there, while he's been forced to wait 13 years to get permission to build a small church. A 900-year-old mosque in Syria has been badly damaged in fighting as the country's civil war continues. A fire erupted inside the mosque, located in Aleppo. It is one of the most revered in the Islamic world. Syrian rebels blame the government for the fire. The civil war is now more than 18 months old. In Pakistan, Taliban terrorists burned down a police station in the northwest part of that country and killed six policemen in the attack beheading two of them. The battle lasted several hours and the terrorists escaped. Meanwhile, the incredibly brave Pakistani teenager who has waged her own battle against the Taliban is in England now, fighting for her life. Malala Yousaf Zaya was transferred by air ambulance from Pakistan to Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, where she'll receive more specialized treatment. Malala was shot while riding a school bus, attacked by Taliban terrorists, who want her dead because she wants girls to have the right to attend school. And as we see now, her courage is becoming an inspiration for her nation. 14-year-old girls don't usually show up on posters and giant murals in Pakistan. Those are usually kept for prime ministers and politicians. But in Karachi, Malala Yousafzai's picture was everywhere. And so were well-wishers and admirers. We are coming here for Malala. I'm here for the Malala. If I'm here for Malala. For Malala Yousafzai. The rally organized by the powerful Karachi-based MQM political party drew thousands who came to pay tribute to a teenager fast becoming a human rights icon. A young girl shot by the Taliban just because she dared to speak out against them. If Taliban are a mind mindset, Malala is a mindset too. It's the mindset of uh, educated women, empowered women. In many of the posters here, you see two names in addition to Malala's, Shazia and Kainat. These were the two other girls who were injured in the attack, but they obviously haven't gotten as much attention as Malala. Doctors say Malala's two friends are going to recover. They have yet to say the same about Malala. I wish I can talk to her and I can just pray for her. Uh, uh, that and, I, and we hope and we pray that uh, she get well soon. And rallies and gatherings like this have been taking place all week. I don't think there's any question. This is one of the biggest ones. Obviously, you're hearing a lot of support for Malala, but here's what else you're hearing. Intense anger and outrage aimed at the Taliban. I want to crush the people who killed, who tried to kill the Malala. You want to crush the Taliban? Yeah, of course. We don't want Taliban anymore in Pakistan. And after the Malala incident, this is about time the people of Pakistan stand up. The masses that you can see here, 
and these people, they are condemning the acts of Taliban. The condemnation was also on a ribbon, the length of 20 football fields. No to the Taliban, they wrote one by one. Many politicians and commentators here say never has there been so much widespread fury with the Taliban in Pakistan. Its anger, many say, could be a turning point in the country's fight against violent extremism. Malala has given us a chance. Um, it's a tragic chance, but Malala has given Pakistan a chance to stand up for their rights and to choose which side they're going to be on. CNN's Ressa Saya reporting from Pakistan. Currents will continue after the break. Next, from the Vatican, the fathers of the Synod explain to us the goals of the new evangelization. Welcome back. History continues to be made this week at the Vatican. Pope Benedict is saying that Christianity is always in perpetual bloom. And the new evangelization that is being highlighted at the Synod of Bishops and the anniversary of the Second Vatican Council will continue to keep the church vivacious, rich, and fruitful. Now, to mark the 50th anniversary of the start of the Council, the Vatican newspaper is publishing a special edition in seven languages that celebrates the 50 years of Vatican II. The paper contains a previously unpublished article by Benedict, written when he participated in the Council as a theological advisor. Also included are pictures from the Vatican archives showing the atmosphere of the time of Vatican II. A net team is in Rome preparing very special programs called Vatican II inside the Council. Now the other major component of the Pope's new evangelization initiative is the Synod of Bishops. Now we hear from three of the Synod Fathers talking to us about reviving faith in a very secular world. I think what we are attempting to do in the new evangelization is a threefold task. Deepen the faith of all of us, beginning with ourselves. If all of our lay women and all of our lay men across the church in the United States had that sense of a deeper understanding, deeper appreciation, we would then be able to move to the second level, the second point, and that is a confidence in the faith to have such a confidence in the truth of our faith that we don't have to be apologetic for it. What we have to do is simply lift up the truth. And that brings us to the third point of the new evangelization, share the message. That's the call, isn't it? Appropriate the faith and then share it. Invite others into the mystery and the wonder and the beauty uh, of the faith. We're not going to need new programs. We just uh, need to have opportunities to continue to invite people who have become tepid in their faith uh, to uh, renew their commitment and interest in the church and, in a sense, to uh, call forth uh, the average person to be an evangelizer, whether it be in government, in business, in industry, in raising families, whatever is the unique aspect of the calling of each lay faithful, uh, for them to be aware of how important it is for them to bring their character, their virtue, and their voice to the shaping of culture. There are certain clear moral truths uh, about which we cannot bend or compromise, but then there's also this more embracing, understanding, conciliatory eff uh, effort to get people in. I wonder if Blessed John Paul II has given us a, a graceful understanding or a bridge between these two poles in that he says to preach the truth, all right, there's the one pole, always with love. So love would require that we never soft pedal the truth, okay? Truth would require that we never forget compassion. I think that would be the, that'd be the hermeneutic that we bishops try to preach and try, we try to have that guide our, our pastoral outreach.
History will continue to be made at the Vatican. Next Sunday, seven new saints will be canonized by Pope Benedict. Two are from New York, Blessed Kateri, the Lily of the Mohawks, and Mother Marianne Cope, who cared for lepers. And as New Yorkers, we are not only familiar with saints, we also know a thing or two about street art. Now, as we hear and see in this Rome Reports, there is some artwork in the Eternal City that's very special. When it comes to street art, most people think about graffiti, but this local Italian is changing that perception. His art is all about Christianity. His projects include posters of Madonnas, Jesus, and saints, all of them placed in random Roman street walls. Nowadays, street art is very direct, violent and aggressive, but these images are clean and simple. The 34-year-old goes by the name of Mr. Clevra. He works full-time as an engineer, but on his free time, he designs religious posters. His favorite style is Byzantine iconography. Over the years, he's posted roughly 300 images throughout Rome and Florence, but he acknowledges that once posted, they are no longer his. They belong to the entire city. That actually happened with a poster I made of St. Sebastian. I went to check on it, and a woman who worked nearby came out and yelled at me. She said, leave my poster alone. I told her I made the poster. She didn't believe me. She thought I was covering it with graffiti. As a Catholic, he says his inspiration comes from a combination of the gospel, his family, and everyday life. With so many churches in Rome, many of them often go unnoticed. But he thinks it's this type of modern religious art that leaves an impression and makes people stop, think, and reflect. Once an elderly woman passed by one of my Madonna posters and gave it a kiss. Then she just kept on walking. That's a good feeling, knowing that the message gets across. His current project is not out on the street, but inside an architectural gallery in Rome. The theme is the apocalypse. I don't do it for fame or notoriety. That just doesn't interest me. What does interest him is exposing the message of Christianity out in the open, in places other than churches, so that all people can be inspired as they go about their daily lives. We continue with more Currents after the break. Celebrating 50 years of good teachings at Our Lady of Hope in Middle Village, Queens, next. Welcome back. For 50 years, Our Lady of Hope School has been the bedrock of the Middle Village community in Queens. The people who are the school joined together yesterday to begin the celebration of their milestone, and they began with Thanksgiving. Today, we thank Almighty God for the many blessings our school has witnessed for these past 50 years. We now look forward to a future filled with joy as we continue our mission. Under the direction of Mary, the Mother of God, and our patroness. Today we gathered here at Our Lady of Hope um, to begin the 50th anniversary celebrations with, the, with this, this celebration of Sunday Mass. And it begins um, a whole program of festivities. What I think is so special, I'll put it that way, about the school is the high academics, the Catholic identity that is very evident in so many ways, not only in the religion classes, but in activities that they perform, and in the spirit of the faculty and parents. What a beautiful community spirit is built between the parents and faculty under the direction of our excellent principal, Ms. Krebs. The parish as a whole, including the school, are really the footprint of Middle Village. Um, we provide a fine education. Um, we certainly have our, our feet in um, the Catholic tradition, but it's also a center for civic association meetings, large sports programs. It's a real community feel and center. There is a, a kindness here, there's a, a true spirit of Christian love here that is very infectious, and I love to come to visit the school. During the sign of peace, the bishop said to me, congratulations, you look good for 50. And I said, I'm not really, if you have to add 17 more years to that. But I thank you, Bishop. My happiest 10 years were right here in Middle Village at Our Lady of Hope. 
The young people had such great enthusiasm, energy, and really worked hard at proclaiming Jesus. They were involved in many school activities. They were good students, they were respectful, and they were very close to Jesus. It's a very nice community, and the teachers I had were wonderful, and my former principal, uh, Sister Schmidt, which I got to see today. It's a really, it's a wonderful experience. It feels like I grew up in it because I've been here so long and the teachers are so nice. They're like family to me. So it's like a second family. I think the instructions that they got from their teachers and the religious environment. So I think it all added together to go for, you know, making it a very successful school. Certainly meeting the needs of, of children and families, uh, both emotionally, economically, and spiritually. I think those are great challenges in today's day and age and in the present state of our, of our country. The future of the school would be to increase academics, far beyond it even, even is now, to make sure they work hard at building enrollment and keeping the enrollment high, and particularly during this year of faith, to be able to move these young people to become more active in their religious faith. And thank you for joining us. Be sure to be here on Tuesday when we meet the niece of a pope. Tuesday night, right here on Currents. Until then, visit us online at currentsny.net. Tonight, we leave you with more from Our Lady of Hope. From all of us here at Currents, I'm Liz Fobles. Thank you for watching, and have a good night.